Welcome to the 12 Monkeys Podcast, a Southgate Media Group production, where we talk all about Sci-Fi Channel's reimagining of the classic science fiction film originally produced by Terry Gilliam. I'm your host, Blair Knight Graves, the executive producer of Professional Geek Podcast, and with me today is Kyle Tremblay, the editor-in-chief at tvbinges.com. You can find us on Twitter at Blair Loves TV and at Kyle Loves TV. And remember, that's Blair with an E. And you can follow this podcast's Twitter handle at 12 Monkeys Pod. Hey, Kyle. How are you doing today? Oh, Blair, I am so excited to, to be joining you again for our podcast where we uh, try to remember character names. <laughs> yes. Uh, last week, you claimed that the striking woman was named Olivia, and you were indeed correct. <laughs> yes. Score one for me. And just to, to uh, verify, this is not something that I puzzled out. This is something that was said on the previous season <laughs> that you and I were trying to remember. <laughs> Because online, she is not listed as Olivia anywhere that we could find. So we sure. should say that. I mean, probably in, like, reviews and stuff. But, like, on the easy sources, like IMDb and Wikipedia. Yeah. It, uh, yeah. So it was a real mystery that had a clear answer. And now it has been solved by, <laughs> by the show itself. Yes. Thank you very much to Jennifer for calling her Olivia. Yes. Um, today, Kyle, you and I will be discussing Season 2, Episode 2, which was titled Primary and written by Sean Tretta who's known for, well, he's known for writing snuff horror films. Yeah, um, his credits include The Great American Snuff Film and The Greatest American Snuff Film, as <laughs> well as being a staff writer on the sci-fi channel Hunters, as well as 12 Monkeys. I- I'm going to guess that those aren't snuff films so much as they are parodies of snuff films. <laughs> I've never heard of either, but I think that that feels like that, well, that's a safe guess. I-, I would I would agree. When clicking on them, they looked like they still had grossness to them, so maybe like a Tucker and Dale versus Evil situation they, or like Cabin in the Woods style. I'm not sure. I'm, I didn't investigate all that much. Th- this week, the podcast is about guessing what movies we haven't heard of or about. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Last week, it was about character names. <laughs> so everybody settle in. <laughs> yeah. Buckle, buckle up in the time machine. Yes, <laughs> You're going up. on a ride with us. <laughs> but yes. So we're going to be talking about Primary, um, which was an episode that Highly featured one of your favorite characters, Jennifer Gunn. Yeah. <laughs> I, yeah, I, I enjoyed her. It also featured uh, uh, Donald Trump, Bernie Sanders, Hillary <laughs> Clinton, primary. Get it? It's ha 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 ha. So funny. Politics. <laughs> yeah. um, I don't know why that reminded me, but I'd like to warn our listeners that there's a giant thunderstorm happening above me right oh, now. Oh, yeah. Well, the, 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 the mention of Donald Trump uh, prompted you to remember the impending disaster that is over your house. <laughs> That's exactly what it was. Uh, but so there may be a splinter or two happening as well. So we'll see. Oh, yeah. We're gonna spl- <laughs> you're going to splinter mid-podcast. This podcast, yeah. the second half of this podcast is going to take place in 1944. Done. 100 yes. years in the past from where we're at in the show right now. <laughs> it's going to be a radio play. <laughs> yes. All right. Well, we should start at the beginning. Beginning, which is the moment where Cole convinces Jennifer to let go of the bottle full of disease, thus reshaping the timeline. Um, I don't know about you, but I don't understand Cole's motivations at all right now. Well, <laughs> it, it's an extension of last week, obviously, where we've really had a role reversal, right? That's what the season has been about so far through two episodes is the Cole and Cassie role reversal that, and I think, you know, Upon uh, some some introspection and retrospection and mostly reading Twitter, what I'm getting is that spin- Cole has spent a good amount of time now in like the present day, right? Like 2014 or whatever this is taking place. And, well, Cassie has spent a good amount of time in 2044, I think it is. Yes, and she's so, in 44 and he's in 16. Yes, so – the time spent in 2016 has had the effect of softening Cole, while the time spent in this apocalyptic dystopian future has had the effect of hardening Cassie. And you could say that in season one, the opposite was true, where Cole was from that future and Cassie was from the present. And so that a, a lot of Cole's actions are being dictated by his setting, which is something that's very new and different to him. And, uh, and he is now... Um, taking a, a much different tack uh, with regards to how he views his mission. And and Cassie is true in the opposite direction. Yeah, I, I don't know if you noticed this on Twitter as much as I did, but I have noticed that a lot of our fellow fans um, do not particularly like a hardened Cassie. Um, they, yeah. like, they like her soft and sweet and mildly weak. She never is like 
she's not a weak-willed character, but she's not somebody who, like Cole, could get something done when it needed to get done. Um, she always had to think about something before she did it. Um, I... I love New Cassie and I love the, I love exactly what you're saying the continuity of when you live in this post apocalyptic world you have to be hard. Um I I think I think that Amanda Scholl is giving a great performance and I'm utterly in love with it and I'm very sad to see that other people don't love it quite as much as I do. <laughs> <laughs> I I think it makes sense but but what the, what I like about it is um it's not clear who's right. Um, they have a difference in philosophy now that is that has really been brought um, to the forefront in these first two episodes. But the show isn't really tipping its hand about who's right about this. Although I guess you could you could infer that it's Cole because um, of of what uh, Cassie is told by the army of the twelve. Or yeah, that, that's that, that's them, right? The twelve monkeys in the future who abduct her later on in the episode. Is that in them? The, in the first episode, the, the women in this. Oh, episode. those are the daughters. The daughters, yeah, the, the daughters. daughters of the twelve monkeys. Daughters yeah. of the twelve monkeys. Yeah. Um, what they tell her, which is that she and everyone else except Cole have forgotten something, and that she's overlooking something. And in that case, it was the the sort of debt that Cole uh, had to had to. Uh, or had to be repaid to Cole for, for saving Jennifer, uh, in the, in 2016. But, but, um, there's, it does seem to me at least that the show is doing a pretty good job about not blatantly making one character right and wrong, which is why I think that it, it works for both Cole and Cassie, this sort of role reversal. Mm -hmm. Um, even if, as we've talked about the motivations behind it are, are while I think a little bit, easier to, to read with a, with a week to sort of think about it. Um, still, a, still a little bit murky about why they're both doing the things they're doing so intently. Yes. <laughs> you know, why, why the old Cassie, well, why, why Cassie really does feel like a different character this season. And if you watch like the first couple episodes, why Cole feels like a different character from that. Yeah. I actually have weirdly a much harder time believing Cole softening up mm -hmm. as opposed to Cassie hardening up um, because you go to a place without where food and water are scarce and electricity needs to be you know handmade and, right. um, and where you're just surrounded by killers and you're being forced to kill in order to survive I think it makes a lot of sense to me that she would become what she did Whereas, I mean, the premise for Cole is that he's been eating a lot of hamburgers and that's made him soft, you know? Like, <laughs> yeah. that's sort of my but, interpretation. But, but there's something else with Cole, which is that, um, by, which is that he was proven right in this episode. When he uh, talks Cassie into sparing Jennifer and Jennifer into giving him the vial, and then they are still able to destroy the remaining vials, um, it doesn't... It, it it makes a difference in the future, although it doesn't fully alter the future. Um, so at least in the short term, Cole is right in that stopping Jennifer from releasing the plague didn't change things in right. like a, in like a, a fundamental way. Although while we're here, can we just talk about that being the coolest time traveling sequence? Oh, I've ever I, seen? I loved it. I loved that scene of the this, future rewriting itself. This is why this is why I love Twelve Monkeys. Like that, it was able to show that. There's yeah. so many time travel things where it's just like you snap your fingers and it's different. Um, you know, they close their eyes, they open their eyes, and oh, we're in a different place now. But actually, watching the future rewrite itself in like in Joan's hands and the walls around her. Oh my gosh. I just, as a, as a film geek, I just, <laughs> I, I would watch a whole movie about that. <laughs> yeah. Oh, oh, that scene from Joan's perspective where time is altering itself in real time, uh, was really special. That was a really special scene. Um, that is wholly unique to this show. You know, you never, you never see a scene of that nature on any other show. No, uh, as you were talking about, and that was that was really nice. No, that yeah, I just I, I want to have it on repeat all the time. It's so cool. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Uh, but in the new future, uh, some doctors that had previously died are back, which some people on Twitter seemed really excited 
talking about, and I oh. hardly remember those characters. No, but listen, we we couldn't get the strikey woman's name last week, and we weren't <laughs> sure about it. You think we're going to remember, like, the side doctors? <laughs> Come on. <laughs> I, I, I know. Uh, but then uh, I can't even – I don't even know his character name. But um, Michael Hogan joined the cast. Uh, from from your beloved Battlestar Galactica. But Colonel Ty from Battlestar Galactica. Hey. He's here and he's Jones's sweetheart. And they had the beautiful moment at the end where he said, the most fun I've ever had is breaking down your walls and I can't wait to do it again. I'm just like, oh, I'm, I'm shipping them out so hard already. <laughs> I love him. Yeah. I, I love him. I love the idea that Jones, the, uh, the very um, loner kind of character, um, brilliant mad scientist sort of figure uh, – has mysteriously acquired a boyfriend. <laughs> yes. It's, it's a, it has a lot of comedy potential, if, yes. if, if nothing else. And she's actually got great comedic timing, so I'm very excited for oh, it. Oh, yeah. Well, that, that's, that's sort of the secret to that character, is that she's actually very funny. Yes. And, uh, and that, that is, uh, sort of unlocks the whole, everything else about her. Yes. I'm, I'm excited to see if they move anything around in terms of the Hannah plotline, because obviously we're now seeing Katarina, or Kat, um, in in her youth again, and it seems like they might be they might be bringing that character back more than once um, this season. And so I'm interested to see if that is something that they're going to change because obviously they've done it for Ramsey, where his son Shane was brought back to life, um, which is just 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 gives you feelings. <laughs> <laughs> sure. Ramsey is such an incredibly well-written character. Um, Kirk Acevedo playing him does such a great job. And him and Deacon had such great chemistry during that torture scene. Weird thing to say. <laughs> <laughs> yes. But it's very it's very cool to see time rewriting itself in that way, though, that, that all these people who've been injected, which, by the way, I would love to be injected with that and just be able to travel time. Um, mm -hmm. uh, but just to see the way that, 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 that they're bringing back old plot lines that were motivations for characters but you always just thought that they would be you know just that the hindsight the the, tw the 2020 in the background um so i'm very excited and i'm interested to see if they're going to make cat actually i'm calling her cat now uh <laughs> if they're gonna make joan's daughter come back because that, that'll be you know that they, that they focus so much on her emotionally to create to make her more of an emotional creature in this season by adding a boyfriend character and by bringing back the daughter. Um. The interesting thing with her is is that she is... We're, we're seeing the beginnings of what happened to Cole happen to her. That she is now uh, experiencing some degree of like non-apocalyptic life where, where she might... Uh, especially if her daughter returns, but now she's got, a, you know, relationships and she knows people and, you know, she had just been this sort of lone scientist bunkered up in, in this apocalypse bunker and now is, is, is sort of being given things to hold on to. And, and obviously that has played a large role in Ramsey's actions, mm -hmm. um, having, having, uh, you know, his, his son, um, and so now, you know, Cole is finding things to hold on to, um, which appear, which might be Jennifer. Um, and, and so, and at the same time, you know, Cassie is kind of losing her things to hold on to and seeing, you know, spending a lot, an extended period of time in a world without anything to hold on to. And I think that that is becoming one of the major themes of the shows that's cutting across all the individual stories, which is what is your connection to the world as it is and how does that affect your actions in, in um, potentially altering what that world could be. And especially in the case of Jennifer in terms of her tie to the world was her belief was to end it, to be in right. charge of the apocalypse. And now, now she's in a position to create her own fate as it were. Um, and, and it's very, I, I had, I have conflict with, her and Cole being sweet on each other. I don't want Cole and Cassie together by any means. I don't ship them for some reason. Um, but I do, for some reason, take issue. But that's also just because, as, as everybody listening knows, Jennifer is just not my favorite character. I think the performance is great. Uh, Emily mm -hmm. Hampshire does a great Good. job. <laughs> yes, the performance is great. I just don't feel anything toward that character. I, I don't think Cole is sweet on her. 
I think, and I don't know if she knows enough to, to be sweet on him. <laughs> it's, it's a very interesting dynamic where Cole didn't react to the, uh, the sudden kiss this week like someone who was, like, super interested in her. Yeah, but he didn't act mortified either. No, he was more surprised. And it was, on, it yes. was sort of left up to um, the viewer to, to gauge what that meant. Um, but also, she does seem like the kind of person who would kiss someone without fully thinking through why she's doing it. Um, yeah, it's a weird relationship. And there is a, a sort of um, element where she's highly unstable, and therefore it's hard to write a character like that into a romance because she's just so out there and, and oftentimes, um, frankly, uh, childlike, which mm-hmm. is which makes any kind of romance um, – feel a little icky like i see what you're saying with that you know just her sort of childlikeness is a little like not compatible with romantic stories oh yeah definitely with him telling her go sit over there go do yes it's just very it's not it does not lead to a good thing in my brain (laughs) um but i did (laughs) she was very funny in this episode Mm -hmm. uh insisting on the prime number 607 and calling him morris morris (laughs) Yes, we will. Yeah, Morris. She she improvises the name Morris Morrison, which is a great fake name. It's, <laughs> it's one of those rock star names that they check into hotels under. Um, and then at one point, there's a really cool scene where she's sort of uh, uh, recapping her role in all of this, and in kind of like a, a an echoed voice, she says, "I am time." <laughs> and uh, so we were really like circling around a Morris Day and the Time joke <laughs> that never came, <laughs> but I really, really was hoping for it. <laughs> we had Morris and we had Time. I mean, we were right there, <laughs> <laughs> just, just so close, so far away. I know. And if any character was ever going to make that kind of joke, it would definitely be Jennifer. <laughs> so. Um, I do like that uh, they they brought her back full circle to the future, as we were discussing earlier, um, letting Cole know that the debt has been paid. Um, I her her daughters, the minions. Like, if I could just see like a, a bunch of women at Comic Con uh, cosplaying as that, that would just make my day. Yes. <laughs> that was some of the coolest costume design I've seen in television in a while. Uh, very very post apocalyptic and futuristic, but very much its own thing because like I feel like like I love Mad Max Fury Road don't get me wrong but I feel like that's a very common view of the post-apoc and and this is much more in in the tribal sense in in the practicality of of going back to the the way that before the industrialized age that people dressed um with, with a little sensuality added in but <laughs> I, I, I like the costumes as well did you just abbreviate post-apocalyptic as post-apoc yeah, I did. Oh my gosh, <laughs> what are we even doing? <laughs> yeah, no, I like I like them too, and and uh, yeah, I I I um I particularly enjoyed the uh, the wordless scene where uh, after Cole is is brought back due to the uh, daughter's uh, uh, kidnapping of Cassie, there's a there's a shot of Jennifer in the future just sort of looking up at the camera, which I thought was cool. Did I get that? Cassie or Jones? I thought they kidnapped Jones. Oh, Jones, but then she... They kidnapped Jones, but then she got Cassie to go back and get Cole, right? That yes. Was the, that was the deal. Yeah. Yes. So it was Jones, but then Cassie was uh, employed by Jones, too. Does does Jones not time travel because she has to operate the machine and or she doesn't want to bump into her past self? I think so. I, I think judging by her past self's interaction with Cole, I think Jones is very concerned about accidentally rewriting the timeline. Cause if, if, uh, if anything bumps off Jones's timeline, then none of this matters. Yeah. The whole time machine thing goes <laughs> so <It's> sideways. <laughs> yeah. Right. It all, it all goes bad. Yeah. Um, what did you think of Deacon's character change? Like very clearly being pivoted into being a more of a series regular than just being, a side character who's you know basically like the warlord um yeah who, like he's very much like present now in this new future uh, he got a cool new costume change <laughs> yes uh, got his he, leather jacket <laughs> he may or may not be sick anymore because of cassie i'm not sure um yeah well the, i mean after that interrogation scene uh the torture scene 
<laughs> Ramsey turns the tables on him to such an extent that Deacon has to leave the room and drop down to his knees. He's been stung so badly with Ramsey's words. <laughs> It was, it was a real, real tough moment for Deacon. Um, Much more emotional Deacon than we're used to seeing. Yeah, no, yeah, he's he's sort of joining our uh, our our sort of crew. You know, he's our our main crew, and it's, I hesitate to call them the good guys because uh, their status as good v evil seems to be fluid, uh, a la Ramsey. <laughs> um, so you know, like, but he's yeah, he's like part of the part of the uh, time machine crew that is now. Uh, uh, just in sort of around every day, you know, where I assume that yeah. they like hang out in the break room <laughs> of the time machine facility. Well, they're certainly our protagonists. He's joined our protagonists. Yeah. Whether or not they're good guys is still up, uh, up for debate. Right. Um, he is in all the cast photos for this season, which makes me think that he's been promoted to series regular, but I'm not sure. Well, look, I mean, as we were talking about last week, he's someone who you always like to see him on screen. I think he brings a, a really nice energy. Um, to the show and and uh, yeah, I, I mean, I'm all I'm all for Deacon having a larger role this season. Although it's not completely clear to me what that role is going to be because it seems like we're we're heading back to uh, 1944 with our uh, with our two our, our two Cole, Cole and Cassie here um, to to do some do some business. Yeah, I'm very excited to see that. Um, I was seeing some people on Twitter talk about how they were one they were were so excited that this virus this virus plot was being let go of. And I don't think that that, I, I don't think no. that that is the indication at all. I just think that they've broadened the world much more. Um, I well, would, I would if, go. Uh, if the virus plot was let go of, uh, the show wouldn't exist. Exactly. <laughs> the, the, uh, there's still like an apocalyptic 2044 world that everyone's in. So right. a <laughs> virus was still die. released. Yeah. yeah. There are more people alive, and there's there's music on the sound waves, but uh, the radio yes. waves. Um, I would say I would have preferred a better clue as to why they need to be in 1944 than mm, just yes. a sure. That doesn't seem like the, like there's a big paradox well, there, isn't there? That they need to was... see a picture to be sent back in time, but then they need to be able to be back there to take the picture for them to be able to see. For them to want to go back in time, like at what point yeah. in the timeline did they just naturally no, no. decide to go? <laughs> listen, listen, we're not. We're, we're, our chances of cracking an issue like why does that picture exist <laughs> are, are are literally zero. <laughs> like we <laughs> we aren't going to get to the bottom of this one. Um, I've, I've I've given up the ghost in terms of uh, trying to like solve exactly how the show conceptualizes time travel <laughs> but i know that the show does it in a very thoughtful way and i trust that they know what they're doing and that the sort of vagaries of how it all works are are part of the show's design they're a feature not a bug you know that that's that's the mystery of the show is is uh how this all interacts and how actions will affect reality as we saw in a big way in this episode but yeah i mean there was definitely some exposition about why they have to go back to this specific time period i know that this is apparently crucial in terms of like what the uh oh what are the what, olivia's team team olivia what <laughs> what they're up to yeah. um it, it seemed like there was a, cl a hint in that regard but yeah I, I didn't i didn't get like a super strong sense like i couldn't like tell you specifically why they yeah. have to go back, but that's just sort of uh, par for the course in terms yeah. of in terms of me understanding the right. plot. I'm willing to give them until you know two episodes from now. But if 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 they leave it at well, there was a picture of us, so we must go back. I'm gonna I'm gonna have problems with how they're. No, I, 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 th I think I think they gave us more than that. I think that it just it's just something where it was sort of stowed away in exposition, and if you're not really like locked in, you're it's probably just like not something like you're, you're 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 reading twitter at that point <laughs> like right, it all right. happens. exactly um side note i did just check imdb and she is no longer listed as the striking woman she is listed as olivia oh so, so someone heard her podcast somebody it? listened to her podcast and went and changed it there we go <laughs> we, we are affecting change i was literally going to say that um, I guess the last thing that I wanted to say or talk about, um, is kind of going back to the, you know, the different personalities that Cassie and Cole will be representing now. 
Um, and I'm very excited, as I said earlier about Cassie, but she said a line. I think it was her last line. I think we're going to quote the same line here. Is it what I am is because of me? Yep. What I am is because of me. Nobody else. I, it's my one note that I took on this episode. <laughs> no, no I, I took it down um, yeah. it's, as well. I think that so often, especially in sci-fi shows, um, you know, I, I, I would list Doctor Who, not that I'm a huge fan of Doctor Who, but I think it's a great example of where um, where a, a female companion is, is is seen as that, as the companion, as, and I know in Doctor Who they've had male companions, but predominantly they've been female, and it's that there is this magical man that is showing the, the woman the, the majesty of this world mm-hmm. and, and shaping their personality and shaping who they become and on all that. Um, but to see Cassie really say, no, you are not responsible for who I am. Um, really, I think is, is incredible character work and really brave of the show to be willing to go there. Because as I said, there are just so many science fiction shows that, that don't. Yeah. And uh, you know, Cole was essentially mansplaining her own personality to her. <laughs> <laughs> and but he was doing it in such a way that was not even detectable because it happens so often, especially as you were saying in sci-fi. That that if if she had not commented on that, I don't even know if we'd be commenting on that. I mean, you might have picked it up, but it's like it it is so common for a, for a an interaction like that to take place where the where the female character uh, is being treated as a companion, like you said, and, and that. It's not like a formalized thing. It's just like how it is. Like everything that happens is due to the male character and the female character is being affected by that. And, and in this case, the male character was taking like responsibility on for changing who she was. And like, it, I, I, like you're saying, especially in the world of sci-fi, that's just like, again, par for the course. Like that's just a, that's, that is something that is so common that it doesn't even register as, as anything being wrong with it. Right. And and so I think in this world in particular, in, in like the universe of science fiction, it's really great to see a show be self-aware enough um, to comment on that. And also, given who Cassie's become this season, to do it in a way that is completely in character for her. Mm-hmm. That it, it made sense for her to say that and for her to, to be offended by Cole assuming that he's the hero of this narrative when he's just been joking around in 2016 (laughs) and she's been the one living the apocalypse and trying to actually solve this. And he's the one who's trying to like soft pedal the solutions like, Oh, let's not kill anyone. Let's not be hasty. And she's the one trying to get stuff done. Yeah. She's going to be offended that Mm -hmm. he acts like he's responsible for who she's become. And that that's somehow like a, a worse version of who she was. And and so I really thought that was the moment that who Cassie is now makes sense. And, and you had mentioned like people on Twitter aren't thrilled about who she's become, but I feel like that moment is where it it turned the corner into like instead of being like a you know like like a almost like a gimmick like oh Cassie's the tough one now. It's like no, this is who she is now, right. and she's not gonna take Cole acting like. She's anything but the main character of the show. You know, Cole Cole is just this random prisoner who was sent back in the past. <laughs> and like Cassie's this brilliant doctor who's like who's who's so important to, to solving this entire thing. You know, on, on, like objectively, she is way more important than he is in this narrative. And I think that th- that was the moment where that was like firmly established between the two characters. Well, and I think that the show is perceived by a lot of people, as you were saying, that that Cole is the protagonist, that yes. Cole is the main is, is our main character. He's who we're following. And I have strongly felt for a long time that this show is about Cassie and, and Cole is the vehicle that we reach Cassie yes. and, 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 and he is more her companion than anything else. Yes. He's the one with the special time travel knowledge, not anymore. Um, but, but he, she's the one who, who calls out the virus, what was going to be 2016 and now is 2018. She's the one who's, who's going to be at the front line and battling the virus. She's the one who actively can actually fight this thing whereas he can only just be a soldier relaying information 
Right. Um, yeah. Yeah. So well, I think show, it, mm -hmm. Just to say, I think it's incredible, as you were saying, that the show really wanted to make sure that us fans, us viewers know that. Yes. And, and I think you're exactly right. I, th I think she's always been the main character of the show, but it, it, it throws you off because, you know, he he was played by Bruce Willis in the movie. Um, which, which is, you know, if Bruce Willis is in your movie, Bruce Willis is the star of your movie. <laughs> yes. And in a movie, we don't, you know, you don't fully experience the sort of unfolding of a, of a grander narrative. But just from who the characters are, of course, she's a more important figure. But we also have to start from his perspective because he's obviously someone who has more complete not being from the future, has more complete knowledge about the situation than she does initially. And so I think a lot of people, you know, uh, Cole, it's fair to say, is the main character in the first two episodes of the series, two to three episodes. But over time, he's passed the baton to her. And I think that that's been like a, a an undercurrent in season one. And now in season two, with this sort of hardening of Cassie, uh, punctuated by this line that we both enjoyed, uh, it's now official. Cassie is the main character of this show. Yeah. Cole is the sidekick. And, and that's also, just the reality. Yeah, and also that is solidified by the fact that she gives an opening monologue for this episode. Yes. Um right. and it is this it is it mirrors the the monologue that, that Cole gave in season one. Mm -hmm. But I think it's again, as you said, taking the baton, she's saying, It's mine now. This is my story now. Yes. Um and we are meant to follow her. Yep. Um well I'm glad that we both had the same reaction to that. Yeah, we wrote down the same <laughs> line. That's pretty good pretty phenomenal all right well this wraps up our 14th episode of the 12 monkeys podcast before we go i want to mention a few things you can download and subscribe to our podcasts on itunes stitcher youtube and libsyn you can also hear all of our podcasts at our website southgatemediagroup.com please subscribe to the show and also rate us check out my new podcast professional geek podcast a show about how to be a professional and also a geek Follow the, this show on Twitter at 12 Monkeys Pod and Kyle and I at Kyle Loves TV and at Blair Loves TV. And remember, both Kyle and Blair haven't yet at the end. Thank you again for tuning in, and we'll see you next time.